the first memory I have um, of having any consciousness of something that came to be called AIDS was uh, probably 1981. I was going to school at Columbia University, and uh, it was a friend from the film school who stopped uh, my friend and I and said, did you hear about this weird thing that's, that's going around and all these gay guys are getting sick? And uh, um, I think he used the phrase, uh, gay cancer. My wife and I were on a train going from uh, uh, Manhattan to Chicago to visit some friends. And this was in the very early 80s. And we were uh, more or less the last people to leave uh, uh, the dining car, except for one guy at the other end who struck up a conversation with the waiter. And the waiter asked, so where are you going? He said, I'm going home. Um, and the waiter said, oh, really, uh, for a visit? And he, said, and he said, I've got AIDS. And I remember being really chilled by that and, and even frightened by it at, at the point. It was just at, at a moment when, uh, very early days, um, nobody knew anything. And I immediately thought, huh, a guy with AIDS in the dining car? What about his forks? Buh, 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 buh. I was really, really quite frightened by it. And I think I was probably aware of it just by way of anybody who scans the front page of the New York Times. That it was this growing, burgeoning mystery. There was suddenly this thing that started out being called GRID and now was becoming AIDS that had moved from the kind of like esoteric stories and then became part and parcel to the, the major headlines. What everybody knew about AIDS is it seemed like nobody was getting completely better from it. Everybody was either sick and getting sicker or just plain sick. There was a lot in the press about how do you catch it? Can you get it from a toilet seat? Can you get it from shaking hands? Well, no, what if it is airborne but we don't know it's airborne because it takes six years before you get it that way? And there, there, so there were all kinds of paranoid things. Can uh, gay teachers teach kids and uh, Haitian refugees are locked up in Guantanamo, and so there was a lot of, um, uh, a lot of fear around AIDS. Things were still, at that point, rather dire. In the mid to late 80s, it was often hard to see uh, that there was any future. My wife Joanne's best friend in the world, Juan Suarez Botas, um, called up one day and told Joanne and me that he had tested positive for AIDS and we were just traumatized. This was still in a period in the late 80s where there hadn't been the medical strides that have arrived today which have helped many people prolong their lives. And um, it was a, always a big question mark as it remains today, you know, will this progress? Will it progress rapidly? Um, how damagingly and, and what route will it take? The response to AIDS wasn't the response that you'd have to uh, an epidemic of people getting sick from some other disease because the patient population was primarily um, gay men, uh, an ostracized uh, segment of society. My response was, um, we've got to keep Juan alive. Um, uh, what do I do for a living? I'm a filmmaker. Films can sometimes influence the way people think and feel. Maybe we can make a movie that will address this terrible indifference and even hostility that people with AIDS um, are, are faced with uh, on top of the already daunting challenge of having the illness. And it made me realize and personalize um, just how bad America, the American government, huge sections of the population were, instead of viewing people with AIDS as um, people deserving of every bit amount of sympathy, nurturing support, and showing tremendous courage in the face of a brand new, authentic, horrendous epidemic for which there was no cure. There was a lot of work to be done, clearly, to wake the country up, to change the country's attitude in a very dramatic way. I'm thinking maybe we can make a movie that will address that stuff and to put a human face on this and help everybody relate to it and maybe in some teeny tiny way um, we can, can be part of what has to be an, a major enormous move to get this country to wake up and help these people. And I think all film has an opportunity to be instructive. I know as a kid I saw The Killer Mockingbird and it was phenomenally instructive to me. Um, all those, the uh, uh, Gentleman's Agreement was instructive. Movies, issue movies, or movies that are about other cultures and situations are just in their nature informative and instructive. There's nothing like seeing it on the screen and having it visualized to 
both create a sense of identification uh, to move hearts kind of and to inform minds. So I think film is as powerful a medium uh, as we have. I love you, Andy. Love you too, John. We called up Mark Platt and Mike Metaboy at TriStar Films and told them about our interests, and they were very, very, very open to that and were instantly on board. I remember very clearly Mark's first comment was, do you know that right now there are 10 scripts in development about AIDS out there in, in the Hollywood community, and do you know that all of them are about heterosexuals with AIDS? And he said, I think that's wrong. I said, I, I don't want to make that movie. I want to make this movie. I think studios are, have traditionally been um, more conservative in their taste and avoided, uh, certainly they avoided this issue and avoided homosexuality. Hollywood movies cost a lot of money and they need to make a lot of money in order to succeed. When you talked about Philadelphia on paper, the question was, okay, who's this for? We thought it was just imperative that we have a, a story that would have kind of universal appeal because we didn't want to make a movie for people that were already sensitive to uh, the people with AIDS. We wanted to reach the people who were insensitive. We assumed that a lot of the people going to see the movie either wouldn't have a lot of friends who were gay, might not think they knew anybody who was gay. At the moment of, um, of us really getting in gear and starting to get ready, um, there was a sense of a lot more activity going on for other films that were going to address the AIDS epidemic one way or the other. You know, one of my favorites is a little independent movie called Parting Glances which I really loved. Of course, there was Longtime Companion. There was an early Frost. Longtime Companion probably had a member of the choir sort of like audience attached. I mean, people who lived in the gay community probably, you know, saw that movie more than people who do not live in the gay community. And an early Frost was meant to be mainstream. It had that same sort of like drama to it. Dad. I'm gay, you know, you're in my, no son of mine is gay. You know, it had one of those kind of, uh, one of those kind of storylines, which is, is probably as, as, as far down the line that it could have gone because it was, it was literally first out of the box. This was a mainstream studio motion picture that was going to cost a substantial amount of money to make. So therefore it was going to have to compete in the broad, open, mainstream marketplace. The picture that I did before Philadelphia was Silence of the Lambs. When Silence of the Lambs came out, it was attacked from some quarters as being homophobic. Silence of the Lambs appeared to some to fall into a tradition of taking a gay character and stereotypically using them as a villain or a source of ridicule. And I came to understand and realize for the first time that in fact the portrayal of gays in movies had been profoundly limited to these kind of things. And along comes Silence of the Lambs with our very complicated guy pretending to be an old woman thing and psh, gets sucked into that whole pit too. But it really made me stop and think and my friend Juan Suarez Botas, who was my inspiration for wanting to do Philadelphia, he explained to me himself, he said, yeah, he said, I, I don't agree with that criticism, but the fact is, you can't imagine what it's like, Jonathan, to be 12 years old, be gay, and when you do see a gay character in a movie, they're inevitably going to be a buffoon or a killer or some totally reprehensible kind of character. In terms of actually visualizing um, men or women in love with each other in Hollywood movies, it wasn't happening. Silence of the Lambs kind of kind of helped provoke this whole notion, this whole arena of, of gay imagery in movies, and I'm glad for that. I, I sort of feel like in a funny, weird way we made a contribution to that whole um, dialogue, which was only just then starting. Script after script after script, I was writing one heterosexual after another. And it just felt for me personally that it was about time to uh, come out of the closet, professionally as well as personally, to somehow get a character up there in a mainstream Hollywood movie that was gay and, you know, hadn't uh, uh, murdered anybody. Meanwhile, Juan was going to um, a doctor in Manhattan named Dr. Paul Bellman, who was doing really excellent work, had uh, directed his practice 98% into dealing with uh, people who were fighting AIDS. Juan was going in several times a week for um, different kinds of um, transfusion infusions, and he started telling Joanne and I about these incredible dialogues, these incredible conversations that were happening in, in the room while all the patients were getting their treatment. I feel like in my entire life, 
I've been on trial. And I feel, you know, you sometimes, it's like you're still on trial. But you have to get through that. It's not you. It's nothing personal. It's AIDS. Juan felt that it was a shame that all this dialogue was just kind of like evaporating as it was said. So I suggested to him that he borrow my video camera and start taking it in and record some of them. And then we kind of upped the ante a little bit and said, Clinica Aesthetico can maybe be the producers of this. And we were looking at the stuff that was coming back and it was really terrific. And as he described it, it ran the gamut of emotions. And it was really instructive for us because there was so much humor. And I said, you're a witch doctor? <laughs> and she said, witch doctor? <laughs> that sort of kind of uh, dark, uh, not quite cynical, but uh, slightly skeptical humor of people facing something really, really terrible and, uh, and getting through it somehow. Don't tell me you're going to stick me again. I'm tired of this. <laughs> if you do this again, I'm going to say something to you. <laughs> We also saw in the film that there were a couple of um, people that were very interested. There was an, an actor that stuck out named Daniel Chapman. Very funny guy, very photogenic guy, and always had a great line. What would you do if they found a cure tomorrow for AIDS? What would you do? Get a job. <laughs> So we cast Daniel um, in a part. I said, do I look like I should be on a diet? <laughs> I felt that this is a movie that, that, that most people are going to want to be a part of. I thought it was going to be interesting um, to see which uh, actors were willing to do a risky thing, like portray a gay character. One of the first lead gay heroes, as it were, in, in a mainstream movie. And indeed, um, I was really thrilled with um, the response. A lot of wonderful actors wanted to play um, Andrew. Big mainstream film star, big stars. That's just the way it works. Um, but also, I think that the, it works for a reason. I mean, movie stars are movie stars for a reason, because people like them. And on Saturday night, you know, there's certain people that you like to spend your Saturday evening with. And uh, Tom Hanks is certainly one of those. I got a phone call one day from Tom's high-powered Hollywood agent who said, hi, um, uh, as you know, I represent Tom Hanks, and um, uh, he's asked me to call you to uh, let you know that he wanted to throw his hat in the ring on the part of uh, Andrew Beckett. So I was impressed by that, met with Tom, talked about it, and um, he gave me some uh, extraordinarily exciting glimpses of what his attack would be on this part. I recognized him. I recognized myself there. I saw myself as the non-threatening, at the same time passionate, competitive guy that he is, but uh, in, in a world that uh, is of his own, you know, interest and is uh, of his own making. Tom was already a very, very strong movie star. He had developed a very, very extensive fan base at that point. Until someone such as a Tom Hanks uh, decided to embrace the project, um, it would have been a very hard thing to get Hollywood to, to endorse. As great as Jonathan is, um, and as wonderful as his movies are, I think the subject matter terrified them. Just Tom's endorsement of this movie, of itself, would be equivalent to a, a loosening up on people's parts. That beyond wanting to see the new Tom Hanks movie, it was, wow, Tom Hanks is behind this. Um, I feel a little funny about going to see a movie about AIDS, and I'm, they, people with AIDS make me nervous, and I don't really want to know about that. I want to be entertained. But Tom Hanks is saying yes to it. Uh, he's in it, and he, he wants us to come. So I think that had an enormous impact on the success of the picture. And I think a lot of people see the guy who's really likable. I mean, you just you would love this guy to be your neighbor, your brother, your buddy. Uh, you'd, you'd love to watch the Super Bowl with him. It, it, you just would love him. It was important for, I think, Andrew to be, I want to say blank slate, but I actually mean more like a comfortable picture. Hi, Mr. Hi, Rose and Thea, just the paralegal extraordinaire I was hoping to see. There could be no polarization in Andy. It couldn't be too political. He couldn't be too angry. He had to be actually familiar, I think, to the vast populace who are out there, because otherwise there's going to be other editorial positions that you could place on him that came with 
uh, a which side are you on thing right off the bat. Where I stood as, as an actor at the time, the nature of the work that I had done had been extremely approachable to, to the mainstream. I think there is something very sympathetic and there is something very human um, about Tom. And just that, that, that is something that probably he doesn't have to even work on it, it's just on him. And I think uh, Jonathan was very smart at the time, you know. He knew that the, the audience was going to love that character, was going to feel with him, was to suffer with him. Uh, he got the capacity of putting people in, the, in his position, you know, in the movie very easily. From the day they hired me to the day I was fired, I served my clients consistently, thoroughly, with absolute excellence. If they hadn't fired me, that's what I'd be doing today. He brought his humanity, his, his humor, uh, and, and I think made the part something that's, uh, I think, bigger than what I wrote. You survived what I assume to be your first gay party intact. <laughs> we talked about who would be, and the studio was very concerned with, who would be the everyman's eyes and ears in this. If, if, if I don't think I have any homosexual friends, who's going to walk me through this? Who am I going to identify in this if I see a gay man as a kind of a rare bird, as uh, somebody who I don't uh, identify with. And uh, the idea was that Denzel's character, Joe Miller, could be that person. We always knew that what we wanted to do was to write a part for Robin Williams, um, uh, Bill Murray, somebody whose very name would, in the same way that Tom Hanks would reassure people in some way that, no, no, you're safe to come watch this movie about the gay guy, some brilliant comedic actor um, would send a message that, and it's gonna be funny. Before he became Joe Miller, he was Joe Napolitano. He was gonna be um, pretty much the character that's in the script, but he was gonna be Italian. You decide you must cross the street at this spot, no other. You fall into the hole. Now you wanna sue the city for negligence, right? Yes. Do I have a case? Yes. Gary Getzman, our executive producer, was on an airplane. Denzel Washington was sitting nearby. Denzel said, Hey, what are you reading? Gary was reading a script of Philadelphia. He said, this thing. And Denzel said, let me take a peek at that. So Denzel read it. And the next thing I knew, I was getting a phone call saying, Denzel Washington wants to play Joe Miller. So I thought, oh my God, as long as I've been seeing this guy in movies, I've dreamt about the possibility of working with Denzel. There was no one who I would rather make a picture with. So I thought, I've got to call him up and I've got to be very candid with him here because I don't want to blow anything for the future. So we got on the phone and I said, I said, Denzel, listen, I, I can't tell you how thrilled I am at your interest. However, there's a big, big problem because this part is intended for some great actor with uh, a known gift for comedy. And Denzel said, oh, I'll tell you, Jonathan, do whatever you want to do, but I can be very, very funny. And I said, mm, I'll bet you can. <laughs> <laughs> funny. Hold on, Iris. Excuse me, sir. Uh, sir. Yo. Yo. Then we had, I don't even know which one of us said it, but it was something that, well, okay, so what about the race thing? Yeah, what about it? Um, whichever one of us said that. And I said, well, I feel like if you did play the part, I don't think we should touch a line of dialogue or kind of try to racialize the script in any way. And Denzel said, good answer. Call me if you want me. But then we sort of thought, oh, wait, now wait, we're doing AIDS, we're doing gay. You know, we're doing homophobia, and now he's African-American. You know, is this going to look too much like we're making a point? And um, we just got over that. And we just sort of said, "You, it's just De it's Denzel. And he's such a great actor. Just just let go of that. And we did. What happened to your face? I have AIDS. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. The balance of Denzel and myself put forward this thing that was by and large recognizable to everybody without being commonplace. I mean, honestly, the character of Joe could have been a grizzled old bald guy, you know, with a cigar and lens. Let me tell you. And the choice that they made in, uh, in going with Denzel made us peers. Didn't you have an obligation to tell your employer you had this dreaded, deadly, infectious disease? You know, it's difficult and painful to really look yourself in the, in, the, in the eye, to look in the mirror, and to face up to your fears, and to strip away layers. And I mean, that's in a, in a lot of ways, you know, and not just in, in regards to homosexuality or, or, uh, or AIDS, but just whatever your fears are, you know, to come to terms with yourself is, is frightening. 
All right, well, hey, I admit it, okay? I'm prejudiced. I don't like homosexuals. There, you got me. One of the defining characteristics of Denzel's character, Joe Miller, is that he will, throughout the course of the movie, say exactly what's on all of our homophobic minds. And as he starts to become smarter, he will start reacting in ways, and we can react along with him, and we can loosen up, and we can have our respect grow, and, and, and we can now feel free to embrace and love this guy. So let's talk about what this case is really all about, the general public's hatred, our loathing, our fear of homosexuals. When Denzel visits Tom in the hospital towards the end of the picture, he touches him. And he touches him unselfconsciously, um, and he touches him with tremendous feeling. The least you can do is look at me and give me a little of your time, man. Got it? We wanted um, to have a uh, Hispanic character in that part. We didn't want to kind of get into a let's care about um, white bread gay people, you know, let's, let's accept the diversity there and that's going to help us and that's going to be, it's important that we do it. And Howard Fuhr, the casting director, said, how about Antonio Banderas? And I know my reaction, I remember the moment I went, <gasps> Antonio Banderas from Spain? We could get Antonio Banderas in this movie? And Howard goes, we'll call him up, you never know. Antonio Banderas had been working with Pedro Almodovar, most notably before he was cast. He'd been in the Mambo Kings. Antonio was and is a pretty uh, attractive character, and the idea was to cast somebody who's both a really great actor and extraordinarily good-looking. The next thing I knew, uh, Antonio was walking into our production offices. He had flown over. Tom did come in, and um, we saw them together. What a couple. It was extraordinary. So um, we were off and running. That was a big, big thrill for me. We were practically the whole day basically talking, and in the afternoon uh, we just passed a couple of scenes that are actually in the movie. And half an hour after Jonathan then came, came out of the room and says, well, welcome on board. <laughs> You're part of the movie now. Hello, hello. At that time, because, uh, because I played homosexuals before, and uh, obviously I have never been afraid of doing so, um, uh, the homosexuality for a character is one of his features, you know, as many other ones. Uh, when you make a character homosexual, I, I'm not intending to make homosexual homosexuality on top of everything else. The character is homosexual, but he works in an office, and at the same time he loves uh, uh, basketball, and there are other things that are also part of the, of the life of that person. Not trying to focalize everything on homosexuality, that would be wrong, because it's not like that neither in real life. We made it a point um, in the movie to cast uh, as many gay actors and HIV positive actors as we could. A jury might decide that he has a case. And Ron Vauder specifically had been fighting AIDS for uh, a long time when he got cast. You didn't know he was sick, did you, Bob? Holy shit, did you, Bob? No, no, not, not really. Ron Vauder was one of the great, 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 all-time great American actors. I met Ron when we were casting um, Silence of the Lambs, and um, I was desperate to have him in the movie because he was truly the kind of actor who's just fail-safe. Ron had a very interesting background for anybody, especially maybe, arguably, for um, a gay man. He was a kind of a Green Beret paratrooper at one point in his life, a Jesuit priest at another point of his life, all kinds of stuff, and just emerged into, you know, found his calling as an actor in New York. Ron Vauder's character is a voice of reason and sanity and is a wonderful um, kind of litmus for the movie. I didn't even give him a chance to talk about it. And I think I'm going to regret that for as long as I live. As we approached filming, um, Ron started getting a little sick again. As a matter of fact, there was a, a medical crisis with Ron right before we started shooting. Uh, we were uh, very close to shooting, maybe uh, two weeks away, and Ron was in the hospital and very severely ill. And there was talk about um, perhaps having to let Ron go. He was supposed to start shooting in the early scenes with us, and I started getting really both worried for my friend, although I was confident he was going to recover from this bout, 
um, um, there he was hospitalized. And second of all, I was worried for the movie because were he not to recover quick enough, then we would find ourselves with a, a serious casting problem. We have the opposite of having a Ron Vauder in our cast. We'd have a big gaping hole with nobody in it. I went down to visit Ron a week later, who's still in the hospital, and he looked really bad. And that made me even more scared. I thought, wow, um, zero energy. I told Ron under those circumstances, look, Ron, um, know you're gonna get better. Um, uh, however, I think what I should do is to go out and cast a backup for you in the highly unlikely event that the doctor doesn't permit you to go back to work. Um, we've got to have somebody standing by. And Ron said, I completely understand. You must do it. I remember very clearly that the decision was made that you couldn't possibly uh, have any moral ground to stand on whatsoever if you were making a movie about the injustice of someone being fired because they have AIDS if then, in fact, you fired someone who had AIDS. Kenny Yutt and Ed Saxon, when I reported how my concerns to them, said, well, you know, we should probably go down there tomorrow and see him and, and let him know, because this is horrendous of all people to have to let go from the movie. Why would it have to be Ron Water? They go down um, two days later, and I get a phone call from Washington, and it's they're going, that boy's gonna be ready, he's gonna be fine. I said, what are you talking about? He said, oh, well, we came into his room to see him and he was sitting in his chair smoking a cigarette. We figured that he's, that he's gonna be all right, you know, uh, by the time we start rolling in 10 days. So Ron Vauder, the brilliant actor, Ron Vauder, the amazingly courageous human being, the former paratrooper, um, he wanted to be in that movie and he got his ass out of bed. <laughs> I mean, can, I just, one can but imagine what he was going through physically because he didn't have any overnight recovery, that much I know. Andy. <laughs> oh, am I interrupting you? Uh, in a word, Bob, Charles wants to see you upstairs. He had a brand of, uh, of, a, of a career and artistic um, sensibility and achievement that, look, I could never even, like, even come close to approaching. And here we were in this movie together. He was fighting the virus every day. We were we would always be talking about his weight, and he was completely open book about what he was going through. And, he, and sometimes I'd ask him questions, and sometimes he'd volunteer stuff for me. He'd say, hey, I gotta tell you this thing that happened to me. Um, because it, we were literally playing out the drama. We were literally making it at that day. I was afraid. I suspected Andy had AIDS. The heat that was coming from his fever through his like lawyerly shirt and lawyerly tie and three-piece suit and all that stuff, it truly it radiated. He was damp, he was wet, he was sweating. But I just remember hugging this guy and feeling, this guy must be 10 degrees hotter than the rest of us are. And that's because he's got the fever and he's fighting it today. It wasn't sort of common knowledge that he had AIDS on the set, but we all kind of knew it. Some of us knew it, rather. And it just made it that much more powerful that he was able to do the film before he passed away. Jonathan has always been interested in non-professionals, in stage actors or performance artists stretching out. The idea was to reach into the gay community and reach into uh, the New York performing community and take some chances. We made a conscious effort to try to employ as many actors and extras who were HIV positive. We were able to reach out into that community in Philadelphia and, and got a, a big pool of volunteers who came forward. There was a bunch of guys that were in the party, and most of them uh, were people with uh, AIDS. And I remember asking uh, a guy, ah, the day that we finished actually that scene, it was nice working with you, blah, blah, blah. I would love to see you uh, at the premiere. And he, said, and he said to me, I would love to see you at the premiere, but you know, I don't think I'm gonna make it to the premiere. And, um, and that's the way it was. And the premiere arrived, I asked about that guy, and the guy just passed away. Mr. bring me a three. Michael Callan uh, was somebody that I was really uh, thrilled to be meeting on the set of Philadelphia because Michael was famous in the HIV community. Uh, for many, many years, he was known as the longest living person uh, with AIDS, that he had been diagnosed very early on in the epidemic and that he was living year after year after year and living very happily and successfully, certainly struggling with medical issues, but living. Your blood work came back this morning. I'm gonna come back in a few minutes and talk to you about it, all right? I'll be right here. Good. 
when we shot the scene with Karen Finley in the AIDS treatment room in the beginning, we had a lot of extras who uh, really were desperately sick with the disease, and uh, several of them died during the rest of the filming and post-production of the movie, because those were the people who were most desperately sick. Daniel Chapman is an actor, and he's telling a story which came from his life. Would you like sugar or sweet and low? <laughs> I said, do I look like I should be on a diet? No. And I remember Daniel uh, telling me, um, I think it really, something that was really weighed heavily on him, because he had been a big strapping guy. You know, he had once weighed 190 pounds. And uh, just going through life being really, 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 you know, that, that kind of thin that AIDS took people to. You know, every nutrient seems to have been drained from you. It weighed on him. Mark Sorensen is also in the scene in which Andy's talking to his doctor. He really wanted to see the movie, and he was afraid that he wasn't going to make it to the theatrical release. A video of the movie was sent to him, and uh, he apparently died very soon after viewing the video, but his mother did tell us that he was really pleased. So we had a variety of working titles as we were going through the many, many drafts of the script. One that stuck for a while was People Like Us, and that, that had a good feeling to us, and it, it stuck around for a while. When we went down to Philadelphia, which was chosen kind of arbitrarily as a city to shoot in, it was close to New York, it was photogenic, it had good, good crew there and a good actor pool. It made sense budget-wise, so we went to Philadelphia. And uh, it just struck me immediately as being a fantastic title. It is the city of brotherly love. And um, it stuck. One of the things we noticed about filming in Philadelphia is the varied fabric of life that's there. I mean, you just can go in any part of the city and see great visual stuff. The city just offered up all kinds of great views of life. There was a litmus test for the crew because we shot the AIDS treatment scene early on in the movie. Everybody had to be working in very close proximity to people who were desperately sick with AIDS about three or four days into the shooting of the movie and it was a tremendously informative experience for the crew um, and for the producers because now here we were working with people um, who were likely to die soon. Um, and uh, I think it gave everybody a little bit of a sense of mission about making the movie. Motion picture crews generally are homophobic, no matter what anybody says. And yet all of that homophobia all of that conservatism seemed to disappear at the moment of the filming. You know, I really didn't know very many people with AIDS. I knew of people with AIDS. I had to be educated on to literally how it worked, what the virus does to you, in more, you know, matter-of-fact ways. And I contacted Dr. Julian Falutz at uh, UCLA uh, uh, Medical Center, and he, uh, over a number of conversations, he, you know, he walked me through it. He had read the script and he had some comments on, you know, what was or was not true or dramatic about it. Because, you know, it's, it's very specific chronological order what Andy's going through and I needed to know how these things were going to be affecting Andy at the time on page 45 versus page 92 versus page 114. You know, it's different when you're reading it in the paper or, uh, and you're not really connected to it and, uh, than it is when you're asking concrete questions about how you're going to manifest it physically on a stage later on. It was a substantial eye-opener, probably mostly because it was much more simple than I thought it was. It wasn't as convoluted. I mean, obviously, AIDS affects everybody in very different ways, but w once, once I got a concrete explanation of, number one, how the body works, and number two, how the virus works, it was, it was very simple. And that led into a number of discussions with, uh, with people who had AIDS. I got together with him and I said, okay, look, by the way, if, if, you, if you don't want to answer the questions, just say, shut up. Uh, you, I don't have any right to ask this, but please let me speak, ask some very frank questions. And those questions were as frank as, how did you find out you had AIDS? How did you feel about it, you know, the moment that you were told? What were the circumstances? Um, how did that affect your life? As well as uh, the questions about being gay. But you are gay, aren't you? Well, I don't see how that's any of your business. Yes, I am. For Tom Hanks, the main thing that we were focused on him doing was losing weight during the making of the movie. AIDS is often a wasting disease, and it was powerful, we thought, in the making of the movie if Tom could start thin and get thinner, and he did. We uh, hooked him up with a phenomenal trainer, uh, nutritionist, and Tom lost a lot of weight while working out frantically during the making of the movie. I mean, the guy didn't eat for 
months. I mean, he was just eating almonds <laughs> and a little bit of lettuce every day. And uh, he, he lose an incredible amount of weight. And he was very, very thin. He never wore his own hair. His head was shaved for the film, with the exception for a, a little funny looking fringe around the bottom in order to get the, the wig to blend in more appropriately. I recall Jonathan Demme saying that we want to make sure that Tom Hanks's character is an embraceable figure always. It was a very carefully selected choice of lividity in his skin, as well as an occasional sore, an occasional lesion on his skin. And a lot of different colors, a yellow kind of base to his skin, bluish lividity and greens around the eyes and in the temple areas and doing whatever I could to affect an aging process as well as a, a sickliness. Do you like opera? I am not that familiar with opera. When the opera scene first showed up in one of Ron's many drafts of the screenplay, I read it, and I didn't entirely understand it, and I certainly didn't know how to do it, but I did understand that there was something great about it. The opera scene just came to me one day. I was listening to a piece of music, and I was trying to get inspired. As I often do, I pick a piece of music. It occurred to me that, that Jonathan should hear this, this particular piece of music. And I thought, oh, you know, I'm gonna make a tape from my CD of Maria Callas. And I envisioned, you know, the next time that I saw Jonathan, handing him this tape, you know? And I said to myself, well, you know, that's kind of a queer thing to do. I mean, that's a really kind of like, that's like a real gay thing, isn't it? You know, and, and I felt self-conscious. It's like, oh, you know, is Jonathan going to think, oh, here comes the homosexual. You know, he's all teary-eyed over some opera scene. And I thought, well, now this is interesting, isn't it? You know, here I am writing a movie about uh, this gay guy and this straight guy and the f their feelings for each other and their fears, et cetera, et cetera, and I'm kind of afraid to do this. And I said, so I think maybe I should write this scene. And so instead of delivering the tape uh, to Jonathan, I delivered a scene. This was a scene that, that most people said, cut that out, Let's get that out. That's, that's, a, not only is it like hard to know why that's there, but second of all, isn't that in a way, isn't that kind of a very kind of stereotypical gay thing that he loves the opera and stuff? And I was like, wait, 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 wait. There's nothing, that's not a negative stereotype. People begged us, ordered us, commanded, uh, demanded that we not put this scene in the movie. Certain scenes appear on paper like they're gonna be just a piece of cake. It's all there on the page. You've got a great cast, they'll go in and do it and we'll have a nice camera angle. This was different. There was that how are we gonna do it kind of thing. Jonathan has many talents and I think one of his great, great talents is to know when you give people direction and then when you step aside. But then every now and then, he would say, just try something. And that night, he sort of gave that spirit to Tom, to Denzel, and to the, the camera operator, and to Tack, and sort of said, Tom, do your thing. Tom comes out and nails it in the first take. Just extraordinary. He goes to this place that is a zen moment. We're watching these video monitors, and you know there are just tears, tears, and tears coming. And Jonathan yelled, "Cut!" And the, the the room just exploded. It was as exciting a day of filming as I've ever ever experienced. We had a scene that we cut out of the picture of um, Tom and Antonio in bed together. So what did you say to him? Well, I said, uh, <laughs> "Well, you know, Jimmy, everyone is gonna die." We wanted a scene in which. Uh, that was very specifically about the affection between Antonio and Tom. So I wrote a scene that had no other point. And they are touching each other, and they're talking. Mm. People sometimes you still wish. believe that, don't you? Yes. yes. Of course, I believe it. Of course. And the scene just lies there like some dead dog. You know, because it had no point. It had no other point. It, and its point was so obvious that it was almost offensive to put it in. To be honest with you, the scene just never worked. Something the doctors 
will inject into the bloodstream, you know? It'll, it'll, it'll kill the virus. Something in its realization, something on every level, it was not working, and we tried to make that scene work. And so we got some criticism for not showing that part of their life. I mean, people felt that we were shying away from it, when in fact we hadn't shied away from it. We just had a scene that didn't work. Politically, it would have probably been better to include it. On just a movie-making level, the scene didn't belong in the picture. And there isn't a full-blown uh, romantic kiss in the movie. I would say that as an actor, I would want to avoid the artificial attention that that would have gotten. Uh, that it would have all, all have been about, and have you seen the scene where Tom Hanks kisses so-and-so or has sex with uh, whatever? It would have been this, mo this, this out of this movie that had so much more to say, I think it would have been this, 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 this keystone that we would have had to answer over and over and over again. The truth is, if you look at it, there's a great number of moments where we, where we are, are affectionate to one another. But there isn't that thing that everybody's going to be sitting there waiting for. It's just, I want to see this scene where Tom Hanks and, and Antonio Banderas make out. I want to see what that is. Oh, you got a fever, baby. It was not ever going to be this movie where we say, okay, we're going to be so bold as a show, two guys who are not gay kissing as though they were gay. I, I don't think it was ever going to be that. As to the criticism that there wasn't enough physical touching, that mystifies me, and I don't, I don't buy it for a second. First of all, look at the party scene. And when the two of them are slow dancing together, it's so beautiful and so affectionate. And to me, the scene, the last scene between them. My sweet boy. <laughs> and uh, so that's in as a tribute uh, to my nephew. I was as bruised and battered I could we were using Neil Young's Southern Man under our opening credits, and I wanted a very extraordinarily moving, heavy-duty, guitar-driven American rock anthem to start this movie off with to really relax the guys in the audience. And then, you know, they, okay, my macho chops are going to be honored here. So I called up Neil Young. I managed to get on the phone with him and said, I wonder if you'd consider writing a song for our movie. We're using Southern Man. I'm hoping that, you know, if, if, this, if this area interests you, that maybe you can do kind of a, a Southern Man for the 90s um, that's appropriate to our picture and somehow addresses in whatever way you want, um, lyrically, um, the whole issue of AIDS. And he said, okay, send it out and I'll see what I can do. A week later, I get a phone call and he says, he said, okay, I had an idea and I did a little demo and I'll send it to you and see if you like it. This little cassette came in, and uh, it was from Neil Young, and we, I had it transferred, and I put it up on my Steam Deck, and we played it, and we were, uh, it really stopped everything. It was like time was suspended. I mean, we were crying. We were knocked out by how powerful the song was. City of but it wasn't working for the opening. And then John said, well, try it at the end. And the minute we tried it at the end, it was absolutely perfect. It's heartbreaking with the home movies and the memorial service. It was just absolutely meant to be. Someone is talking to me, calling my name. It's this exquisite kind of elegy. But we still need that rock anthem up front. So I'm going to call Bruce Springsteen, who I knew um, from making some videos with, and I was able to tell him exactly what had happened. You know, I called Neil, and he said he'd, he'd do it, and he did an amazing song, but it's not Southern Man. So, Bruce, will you take a look? He says, sure, I'm interested in this, this uh, subject matter anyway. So I sent him the movie. He was still with Southern Man at the front. I get a call from him a few days later. Okay, I've got an idea. I've, tried, I've done a demo. I'll send it to you. You can listen to it. And I pop it in, and here's Streets of Philadelphia. Not a hard rock anthem. And that's when a, a, a little birdie told me, he said, you know what, maybe these guys um, have more confidence in this, in your movie than you do. From a musical point of view, this was a very passionate uh, piece to work on. And I remember reacting to the film emotionally every day that I worked on it. I couldn't not 
watch it without feeling the power in the story and in the characters and in, especially in Hanks's character. As many times as I watched it, I never ceased to be emotionally involved in it. You know, it was a hit. First of all, it was a huge hit uh, for a serious drama. It was remarkable that it found the audience that it did. It justified our faith and the studio's faith in the, in the story. And we got letters from Marines and, you know, all, all the kind of guys who said, hey, I'm a macho, I haven't talked to my brother in several years because he's homosexual and I saw you moving at that. Oh, wait, maybe that's him. I feel that it's possible that Philadelphia, by being so successful at the box office with a gay hero, must have been more of the solution than the problem in terms of, of portrayals of, of gay characters in general in movies. And I feel that over time, I think we've seen more and more and more and more gay characters who are there because they're part of the community not because they're going to be comic relief and certainly not because they're going to be aberrational. So let's just get it out in the open. Let's, let's, let's get it out of the closet. Because this case is not just about AIDS, is it? Here we had this week of press attention. It was very big. It was all the standard hoopla. And then the movie came out, and it was just about to disappear. And then all of a sudden, this other huge thing came into it that was not just a... Um, it was no longer a review of how the movie was made and how good it was. It was an examination of the movie and what it meant to us as a much broader society. There were people who were disappointed in the movie and angry about it, and, and where that controversy came from took me per really by surprise, completely by surprise. Larry Kramer, the great gay activist, was denouncing us in really vulgar terms. That was extremely hurtful to me. Larry Kramer um, thought the picture was uh, part of the bullshit Hollywood machinery and that it was part of the problem, not the solution, that if you appease people's consciences, they may not recognize that we're in the middle of um, a Holocaust. I don't agree with Larry Kramer. I think we were a part of the solution, but I think Larry Kramer was part of the solution, too. After Larry Kramer, who, if, if there is a hero who deserves the, uh, the Congressional Medal of Honor for what he did in AIDS awareness and an honest examination of what it's done to us as a society, he certainly is the prime recipient of it. When he came up and said, this movie does not reflect who we are or what we do or how we live, Suddenly it became a much more important film for what it did accomplish and for what it did not accomplish. Every now and again, not often, but occasionally, you get to be a part of justice being done. That really is quite a thrill when that happens. You know, Tom won the Academy Award for Philadelphia. And when he won it, he got up and he thanked gay men in his life who'd been important to him. I'm a better man because gay men took me under their wing and taught me things about myself and, uh, you know, aided me and instructed me and, and befriended me. And if I had lived in an atmosphere where I was going to fear them or shun them or not want to have anything to do with them simply because they were homosexuals, then I would not have had the high school drama teacher that I had who taught me that, you know, work in the theater is more fun than fun. If I was going to thank any one person, I'm going to thank the gay man who introduced me to this fabulous way to live your life. I mean, that speech that he gave at the Oscars, uh, you know, it was jaw-dropping. I mean, it was, it was one of the most... And if it came down to my name being called at the time, I would have to say, look, I know why I have everybody's attention right now. It's because so many of us have loved people, and, and they're dead now because of AIDS. The, uh, educational empowerment of the movie as far as AIDS has gone has done some good. How much good, I'm not really sure. I mean, we might have been able to get there as a society as a whole. I mean, the truth is, is people talked about it. There was some brand of awareness about AIDS and people dying of AIDS where there hadn't been prior. What it hasn't done is it hasn't wiped out AIDS. This movie actually brought uh, a little grain of sand to the issue. You know, I, I think it was uh, important at this moment because of that, he opened some gates, especially here in the mind of people to, to know and to be related with that problem. Well, even though there was a lot of talk at the time of Philadelphia's release of a lot more movies are going to deal with AIDS, we haven't seen too many of them yet. Nowadays, when you hear about AIDS, it's much more in the context of the 
horrendous epidemic in Africa where so little is being done to combat it than AIDS in America. We're under the impression now that there's been such strides in the medical response to AIDS that AIDS isn't quite as deadly for many as it once was and that the numbers are going down, but they're not going away. It clearly remains an enormous problem, both here and very much so overseas. There's a lot of great organizations now that are on the case and headed by fantastic people that weren't around in the early days when the um, Juan Botases and Bob Breslow's and Daniel Chapman's and Mark Sorensen's were contracting the illness. I asked Dr. Julian Falutz, the UCLA Medical Center, I said, what's the future going to be? And he, he, told, he, was, he was clairvoyant. He told me what the future is. Back then, he said, the, the people that can will be able to live almost long, longer and almost normal lives in the disenfranchised, in the third world countries, and the people around the world who cannot are going to die in the same numbers. And that's exactly what's, uh, exactly what's been the case.